Welcome to History 111, Lecture 28, The Cotton Economy. For a long time, the American South had relied on a tobacco economy, but tobacco was problematic because it exhausted the soil quickly and the price of tobacco was generally depressed during the 19th century. As a result, people have to move from region to region due to soil depletion and they're not able to make a steady profit because of price fluctuations. So the alternatives as a southern planter are to grow rice, but has a long growing season and needs significant irrigation and is restricted to only certain geographic areas that could really functionally grow this. Sugar, on the other hand, has long growing season. It's very time and labor intensive, but there's major competition from Caribbean planters who are already established. Or you could go with long staple cotton. It's easy to process, but it's also restricted to certain geographic areas. So unless you happen to live in exactly the right spot, tobacco is, is the main crop because you don't have any real good solid alternative cash crops available to you. Now what's going to change is short staple cotton, because it had always been around and it grows in a lot of diverse climates and soils, but it's very hard to process. And it's not profitable for the cotton gin, but when the cotton gin is introduced, suddenly short staple cotton becomes the real alternative to tobacco as a cash crop. Now in addition to that, there's some other factors that are going to move planters away from tobacco and towards cotton. In New England and Britain, there are textile mills that are driving up world demand for this. The acquisition of Louisiana and Spanish West Florida is going to open up a lot of new lands that's suitable for cotton. And in addition, the Indian Removal Act is also to clear that land of the existing population, allowing planters to settle there. So all of a sudden, you have this perfect crop and the perfect conditions to grow it, and a high demand and a high profit for doing so. And that's going to really lead people to abandon tobacco and move to cotton. Now, cotton production is going to really boom. In 1820, there's only a half million bales of cotton produced in the United States, but by 1860, it's grown to 10 times that, to 5 million bales. And if we look at what's being earned in the South in 1860, the highest profit cash crop is cotton, and $200 million are earned from cotton. The second highest cash crop in terms of dollars earned was rice, and that's only $2 million. In other words, the South is deriving 99% of its income from cotton. Now, the shift to cotton is going to set off a large internal migration because a lot of planters are going to move to new states. And in addition, large numbers of small farmers are also going to try to strike it rich by doing the same thing. Now, slave holdings from 1820 to 1850, when cotton really starts to take off, have some significant changes that we can see. So in Alabama, it goes from 41,000 to over 400,000 in that 30-year period. Mississippi also increases more than tenfold. Now, if you look at Virginia, on the other hand, one of the older states, it grows, but it's very slow. And part of that is you have to remember that the official importation of slaves stopped in 1808. So what's happening is there's all these people wanting to move to these new states and wanting to bring slaves with them as a form of forced labor, and they can only obtain them by taking them from existing other southern states. So states that are seen to have a surplus, like Virginia, are basically now exporting slaves to places like Alabama and Mississippi. Mississippi. Now, if we look at the distribution of slaves according to the U.S. Census about every 10 years, what we can really see is that the main slaveholding states at the beginning of the country was Virginia and South Carolina. But over time, we can see the distribution pattern slowly starts to merge as more and more slaves are being moved south and west, till ultimately we see a large number arriving in places like Mississippi and Alabama. Here also what we can see is a distribution in 1820 of areas of cotton production and the distribution and concentration of slaves within those states. And you can see the same thing again in 1860. And what you can really see is there's a concentration that's being moved around cotton production. In the beginning, there's a significant factor with tobacco, but that's really, really growing and being pushed south and west. Now, southern economic development really involves spin-off industries for agriculture like flour mills and so on. There are some manufacturing based on raw materials, some textile mills, some ironworks, and so on, but it's insignificant compared with cotton. Cotton is really what's driving the entire southern economy. Now, the commercial sector is going to revolve around an urban merchant class who is going to sell the planter's crops, and these merchants are the primary source of credit because there's really no banking system. Now, the transport system in the south was primitive and relied on river transport. And for the south, it's all about getting that cotton to market. 
Now, southern agriculture is going to really fuel industrial growth in the north, and the north is the center of trade and banking. Capital in the south tends to be tied up in land and slaves, so planters tend to incur large debts during periods of depressed price, and there's a boom and bust cycle that's going to leave little else. And people start to look at this as being an unfair, unequal system in that the north is constantly reaping benefits, whereas the southern planters hit periods of severe economic hardship. Some people are also looking at this as increasingly as being a counterproductive institution, and some people in the South are beginning to question the cotton economy, although these are going to be issues that we're going to talk about a little bit more later. But it is worth noting that recent studies have shown that non-slaveholding farms tend to have the same profits as slaveholding farms in a similar circumstance, and that has to do with factors like working more slowly, intentionally breaking tools, and other forms of passive resistance these enslaved persons were engaging in to protest their circumstances. So what's the big idea here? Well, first and foremost, cotton dominates the southern economy, and that's going to drive the movement of slaves to places like Alabama and Mississippi, and this movement of slaves to the south and the west is going to be something we're going to see in the debate on slavery later. Also remember, this is driving the northern textile industry as well. These are where the raw materials are going to be produced that are going to drive the industrialization of the north, and over time, with the north being a center of industry and banking, that's going to create what the southerners see as an unequal relationship between north and south, because when there's economic depressions in the South and depressed prices and periods of hardship, the North, those bankers and creditors and those textile mills are still going to be doing very well, and they're going to see this as being something that's not inherently fair. See you in the next lecture.